Yeah. How y'all doing? Y'all doing good this morning? Yeah? Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, it's funny. I'm over here worshiping like normal, like I, I would do. And Liz, she comes over and sits next to me. She says, hey, Wayne, you know, the mic you have on, we can hear you in our ears while we're worshiping on stage. And I'm like, oh, yeah. She's like, yeah. All I hear is, sing it, Don. Go, Don. Sing it, Don. I was like, oh, I didn't mean to be yelling in your ear while you guys were up here on stage worshiping, probably distracting you in whatever way. But um, uh, give it up for our worship team. Yeah. If you're wondering, Pastor Jesse, he did grow here. No, he's not here today. I am in here, here in his stead. And um, you know, I thank God for the opportunity to be here in his stead and to be able to come before you with a word from God. So before we begin that, I'm going to open up in prayer. Dear Lord God, we thank you for this morning. Lord, we thank you for the hearts of every individual that's in this room. Lord, we thank you for those that have come to hear a word from you. Lord, I'm asking that you would move me aside so that you may be heard. Not Wayne, but you, Lord God. So Lord, we're asking that as I decrease, that you increase in this room. And Lord, those that have the ears, Lord, let them hear whatever it is that you have for them on this morning. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for who you are and what a mighty God that you are to us. Lord, we love you, we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 Now, cameraman, I move a lot. So I'm gonna let you know there's gonna be a lot of right and left. But right, right, right now, I'm looking, you're doing an amazing job. You know what I'm saying? Keeping track right now. Um, so we're continuing in a series. Um, we're in the Connected series. And with the Connected series, my job today is to work with what we call with dependence. So it's being connected with dependence. And if you weren't here last week, um, Pastor Jesse did cover uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 18 through 20. I'm going to read that for you really quick and kind of do like a small recap on that. And um, it starts in 18. This is the NIV. It says, but in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. One thing that I kind of got out of that last week, and I'm going to just read it to you because I have, have my notes here. What I got last week was dependence begins with recognizing the value of each individual part of the body. Just as the eye and the head have their unique importance, even though they are in close proximity. One of the first points that I am going to tackle is proximity. And the reason being is the, the proximity highlights the idea that they must work together much like the church body in close proximity should recognize our mutual value. Um, not only as grace, not only as you as an individual, but as kingdom-minded individuals. Sometimes we get so caught up in just the fact that we just want to do what we want to do, and it doesn't matter how anybody else feels, and it's what my little heart wants and what my little heart gets and all those things. And what we have to realize is the kingdom is so much bigger than just us. The kingdom is so much bigger than just Wayne. The kingdom is so much bigger than just grace. As much as the people that go to grace love grace so much, I'm one of them. What I do know is there's not a special place in heaven just for grace. There's not a grace on the east side of heaven over there. And then we, and then we got, you know, this church over here on the west side of heaven over here. No, it's kingdom business. And so when we're here, we have to become kingdom-minded. And so in this, the first point that we're going to make is proximity. And in 1 Corinthians 12, 21 through 22, I think, is that on the screen for y'all? Is that on the screen? Mm. No, Pastor Jesse got rhythm, look. <laughs> no, so... On this, it says, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. Indispensable means to be absolutely necessary. Absolutely necessary. So, the janitor... It's absolutely necessary. 
The facilities crew, absolutely necessary. The kids director downstairs, absolutely necessary. <laughs> There's some parents in this room that if, them, if that kid director wasn't downstairs, we'd be having some welling babies running through here and probably some people running around getting slapped and everything. I don't know. I know, I know, I know some kids that are some slappers. You know that? But when it's all said and done, they're absolutely necessary. So who are we to demean what God said is necessary? But sometimes in our good old flesh, we like to present ourselves as the end all be all that can speak into someone's life and tell them what they're worth. When the reality of it is that God did not position us for that. He didn't call us to that, so he won't keep us through that at all. So the reality of it is, is what it boils down to is the proximity that we keep will either pour into you or tear you apart. How important is proximity? Well, when we look here, there's some couple of examples that we have of proximity. And proximity means nearness in space, time, or relationship. The first I have is Moses and Joshua. Then I have Elijah and Elisha. Then Paul and Timothy. Then David and John. And probably the greatest duo of all time might be John and Jesus, better than Kobe and Chet. <laughs> but the reality of it is, is the reason that they, that they were able to grow that the way that they did was the proximity and the closeness that they had with one another. So you look at Moses and Joshua. Moses was chosen by God to lead the Israelites. Joshua was one of his trusted leaders and succeeded Moses to lead the Israelites. The thing about it is, is God always starts with a leader, but he ends with a team. Every time. He starts with a leader, but he ends with a team. Why? Because there's not a person on this earth that's built to do it by herself. It just doesn't work that way. So if he's done that time and time again, and he has a proven track record of that working time and time again, why are we trying to change his methods? I never got that. I mean, last time I checked, I, I, you know, there's that saying that goes, you know, um, well, if I know the saying... <laughs> It's, um, oh, if it's broken, don't fix it. If it ain't broken, don't fix it, excuse me. Um, and so if this has been working like a weld or machine, and it can go through Moses, and it can go through Elijah, and it can go through Paul, and it can go through David, why can it not work through us? What is so great about us that that same process through these holy men, that it doesn't work for us? Now, you know, I know they did it that way, but I I probably got a better plan than God. God, take a seat next to me. I, I got this. I, I got it from here. A lot of us do that. Because in some way, shape, or form, the world has told us that we know best. The world has convinced us that we know more than what we do. And we've convinced ourselves to believe it. And that's because of our proximity not being close to God. It's easy. You know, growing up, one thing proximity does for, for you is you will learn habits, you will learn voices, you will learn smells, you will learn even cooking. There's a lot, see, listen to that. Somebody said yes over there. She's like, yes, hallelujah, yes, cooking God. <laughs> the funny thing is, is you begin as a child growing up, because of the proximity of your parents, you begin to build certain habits. You weren't born with the habits. My, you know, mom sings walking around the kitchen. You start singing around the kitchen. Nah, 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 nah. It's, it's not, you just are copying what you see. Because of the proximity, you choose to do this thing. Oh, that's what they do. Oh, that's what they do. And because of proximity, also you begin to recognize the voice of your parents. I bet majority of you guys in this room, there's somebody in your life that if they start laughing right now, you'll be like, oh my goodness. There they go with that loud laugh over there cackling. I know exactly who this is. That's Teresa. <laughs> right? I said Teresa. I hope nobody in here named Teresa think I'm talking about her because I don't know. I, but the, the reality of that is, is you begin to recognize the voice. Why? Because you've been around it for so long. 
You spent time with them. You, you built a relationship. You spent years hearing it. So even if it's a whisper, you know the voice. You know what's so crazy? God works the same way. The more time that you spend with him, the easier it becomes for you to recognize his voice. The closer you are in proximity, the better you can understand what he's calling you to do and what your divine purpose is. But if you choose to listen to whatever music you're listening to throughout the week, doing all the activities that you're doing throughout the week, and not addressing God not a day until Sunday, what is really feeding you? Because it cannot be the word, not positive. There's not, it's not, it can't be the word. If you're listening to any and everything, there's no possible way it can be the word. This is what I know about proximity. James 4, 7 through 8 says, Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. It says if you draw near to God, he will draw near to you. Meaning if you're pursuing him, the beauty of it is he's omnipresent, so he, he doesn't have to go anywhere. You just have to unlock that thing in your brain that, that's telling you that you're not worth it, that you're not worthy, that you're not able, you're not capable. All those things that you've heard from anybody in the world that means nothing compared to God, you have to unlock that box to say, you know what? My God has told me that I'm better than this. The word that I read tells me that I'm different than this. The things that God says about me in the Bible, it can't be what this individual is saying. It doesn't sound like the character of the God that I know. It doesn't smell like the God that I serve. It doesn't sound like the God that I serve. So how could I possibly believe what someone is saying because they just want to say it? How many of us in here love pie? Anybody? Amen, amen, amen. If you don't raise your hand, that's probably because you're not good at cooking it. It's okay. It's all right. I'm just going to put that out there. Um, or you just, you know, or just, you know, you don't like sugar or something. I don't know. I don't know who don't like sugar. For you guys that are on a diet that don't eat sugar, Tori, um, it's okay. I, I get it. I, I understand. And, and, and that's all right. But for us that like pie, one thing that we all know, right? If there was a corner store out there, or even our cafe right there, we can all go in there and we can get a piece of pie. I don't know if there's pie in there. Don't go rushing back there because I don't know. I just, this is just a fig bit of imagination right now. But with pie, we can go pick up a slice and be good. Like I'm good. I, I got my pie. Like it's good. The, the, the pie tastes wonderful and all that stuff. But if I want to really know what it is to, make the pie, and how to bake the pie. I got to get in proximity with the individual that knows how to do it. If I want to know like what ingredients are necessary in order for this to not fail time and time again, I got to go to the person that wrote the handbook. So why are we chasing the world on a regular basis for things that they're not equipped to give us? We're chasing them for a piece of pie they don't have. For something that doesn't even exist for them. So why do we, why do we go to somebody? It's like, it's like me going to somebody for marriage counseling that they ain't never been married in, my, in their life. Why would I do that? They can give me all the advice they want to, but ultimately they're, produ they're producing what we call artificial fruit. In the word, it says you would know a tree by its fruit. If you ain't never been married, why are you talking to me about being married? Why are you giving me all the suggestions of, girl, this is what I would do. Let me tell you what. If you don't even got a man, so how are you going to tell me what you would do? <laughs> that makes no sense to me. That's the reality. And some of us boys, we just bad. We give a, yeah, bro, I'm trying to tell you, man. I told you you should never be with that girl. Bro, you've been in 1,500 relationships and not been committed to one. Why am I listening to you? So for us, it becomes, why are we steady listening to someone where you have not witnessed the fruit in their life. 
Proximity is important because you can witness things versus just be told something. Many of us that went to our grandma's house when we were younger, and they had that fake fruit kind of sitting on the table, and it painted, it looks all nice, it looks real and all that stuff like that, and you bite into it, and it's styrofoam. <laughs> Man, you got me. Thought I had an apple. But it was fake fruit. Why? You wasn't in proximity to see it be placed. So even someone that's in this church, you still have to be mindful of who you choose to listen to because just because they attend Grace Community Church and they're here on a Sunday morning doesn't mean that they are producing the fruit that is necessary for you to live Christ-like. Let me get back over here. That side sounds like they're going to throw something at me. This side, y'all seem cool. I like y'all over here. I, they seem aggressive over there. I'm going to probably stay more to the right. Cameraman, we're going to be on the right? All right, all right, thumbs up. In this, though, um, God knows our value better than anyone else. So we can't go to anyone else for our value. In this, things, four things for proximity. You guys can write this down if you guys want to. They're not going to have this on the screen because God downloaded this this morning. So, (laughs) um, but four things for proximity. What it helps with. The ease of communication and collaboration. It builds togetherness and shared purpose. That's what proximity does. When you're close enough to someone, you, it's easy to communicate. It's very hard for me to communicate with my wife if she's over there at the park, we don't have no cell phones, and I'm yelling at the top of my lungs. But close proximity, I can get the message through clearly. What, what happens is the, the further you are apart, the more distorted the message becomes, and you start to believe what you think you heard. And what we all know is perception is reality, even if what you believe isn't true. So that's why proximity is important. Number two on that, building relationships. Get to know each other better, building trust and community. That's what proximity does. Three, shared experiences, challenges and opportunities, understanding needs and strengths. It's easy to just have a relationship with someone, but it's very difficult to really Invest time to understand where weaknesses and strengths are at. Because that means you actually have to invest. That means you don't just get to exist. That means you actually have to talk. You can't just sit there and just be a mute and just look at each other and just be like, mm-hmm. Yeah, oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. You know, I have no idea what's going on in that person's head. But there's some people that feel like they're, I don't know, what is it, what is it called, telepathic or something like that? Some people believe that, yeah, I know what you're thinking. Do you? Because if you knew what I was thinking, you wouldn't be sitting in front of me right now. <laughs> that, <laughs> but the reality of it is, is, number four is immediate support. Emergencies. Immediate support. You got to think about it. The, Joseph said it one time, we were in our men's group, and he, he really went into detail about the triage unit. And there's an emergency room, but they're, they're built for certain things. They're built to help you get taken care of really quickly. It's triage. Like, I can get you fixed up. I can get you ready to go. But you're going to need a doctor's appointment to go to this specialist in order for you to be able to sustain the life that you want to sustain now after that. They make and throwing some stitches and stuff real quick, but they have to get you to a specialist. We have a really, really, really amazing specialist. He specializes in everything everything that ever existed in life. And yet we choose to go to our best friend, Bob. (laughs) I don't know why Bob is so popular, but people like going to Bob for many different reasons, and Jesus ain't one of them. (laughs) Next, we're going to tackle 1 Corinthians 12 and 23, and we're going to talk about honor. And in this, it reads, and the part that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor, and the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. Like I was talking about earlier, there's some people that, is, that are treated less than just because. Um, we have vital organs. All of us know we have vital organs in our body. And what the crazy part about it is, 
is we don't really realize how vital they are until something breaks down. We go through our day, we go through our week, we, we believe we go to bed knowing we're going to wake up in the morning and have a blessed cup of coffee. We just know we're going to. We have all the faith in the world that our body is going to function like it's supposed to on a regular basis. Whether we're doing the maintenance for it or not, whether we're feeding it junk or not, whether we're being healthy with it or not. But we don't understand the value until something breaks in this ministry, we've had some things happen here tech-wise and stuff like that on some Sundays and, you know, power goes off or mics cut off and different things. We go to acoustic tech, like all these different things over the years. We don't know how valuable our tech crew is until something breaks down. Because when you come in and, yeah, come on, come on, come on, clap for them. Okay, this side didn't clap for them. I like y'all this time. Y'all did a great job. I like y'all clapping for them. The reality of it is, is the value of our tech crew wasn't really realized until that started happening. It's like, oh man, we got to get somebody. We're gonna, yeah, we've been telling you we needed somebody for 15 years, but now, now, now you know we need somebody? I'm just joking, you guys. No, <laughs> no but the, the reality is, even with that, is our, our look at our, our young at heart and who they are here in this church. And sometimes we lose the value of our older, younger generation. We don't understand the time that they put in, that they committed to make sure that this ministry is even existing today. The reason that I'm standing here and the reason that many of us young people are standing within this body is because they were strong enough in the season where the world said they shouldn't be capable and they stood up for everything that God believed in so that we can be here today. So just as much as them being vital to the congregation and how it's sustained, it functions just like the heart in how the body stays alive and vibrant because of it. So you can somewhat say, our young at heart is the heartbeat of the church. In so many different ways. But once again, you don't understand the value until something happens. Someone's going like, I used to see so-and-so all the time at the door. I love seeing their face. Did you ever ask them for coffee? Did you ever ask to take them out to lunch? Did you ever build anything with them but the smile walking through the door? You can say you value someone so much, but a lot of people make time for people in their death and they don't make time for them while they're living. They'll show up for your funeral, but they won't show up for your life. So how is that helping? How are you honoring someone? Especially our elders. I'm old school. I grew up in Texas. Um, Mr. Tom to be here. when he, He'll probably be here next service. He hates me calling Mr. Tom. I right, look, my dad has a belt. And I don't know if he still will use it, but he would probably try to if I call any man by their first name that's older than me like that. I'm from Texas. It's yes, sir. No, sir. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. All that thing. So if you do get offended by me calling you sir or ma'am, that's okay. I'll take it up with Jesus, but you're going to be offended. <laughs> I, I, I have to stick with that because that's, what I was taught growing up in my proximity. That, that's how it worked. And, and honoring those that have done it before you, that's about respect. It's not demeaning to you. It's not none of those things. It's respecting those that came before you and paved the way so that you can exist. Part of the reason you are existing. Without them, your mama wouldn't be here. Your daddy wouldn't be here. And your little knucklehead self wouldn't be here. That's the reality. Oh. This next part is dangerous. I may have to say this for second service. I don't know. <laughs> I feel threats from over here. You guys are nice and you smile. And the, the, the middle, I'm just not sure about you guys yet. You guys have not gave me no great indicators yet about what's going on in the middle. But, but I'm here for it. Um, I'll say this. One thing about honoring is also understanding the difference between honor and being abused. 
Sometimes there's people that bring toxicity into your life, and they're just toxic. Whether you're old or young, it doesn't matter. Toxic is toxic. And this is what I know. If there's an infection in a part of the body that is damaging the skin to any capacity, or, or, or damage, let's, let's say you got bit by a snake, and the venom is just tearing all this up. What I know is, is that it's toxic to you until it gets removed. That it's toxic to you until it gets cut off. Hopefully, we, it ain't getting cut off. But it is toxic to you. But the cutoff that God may be talking about is removing that person from your life. Why are you allowing someone that is toxic and that's all they bring to the table every time you guys meet up is something? Something's toxic. Whether it's, you know, they talking about the other 15 people to go to the church that you like. But they always have something bad to say about them. They're talking about Pastor Jesse every single, oh my gosh, his... His head just shines so much when he's up on stage. It just, don't tell him I said, oh, it's recorded. I was going to say, don't tell him I said that. Bust it, man. But there's people that breathe that toxic stuff into your life. You either are choosing to sit there and inhale something that's killing you or remove yourself so that you can breathe again. Sometimes God is trying to pass oxygen your way. You're just, no, 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 no. I like where I'm at. No, no, no. And you're okay with it. And sometimes that's just a season of life where you're in, that you are in a spot where you don't want to be fully committed. You kind of want to sit on the fence. And the crazy part about it is the devil owns the fence. There's no such thing as a gray area. There's no, well, I'm kind of on the fence. He owns it. Because if you're on the fence, that means you're not committed. God needs us to be fully committed. If we're going to be fully committed, you can't sit on the fence. Plus, fences hurt. Have y'all ever sat on the fence? Ain't nothing about a fence to feel good. I mean, that's, maybe I ain't got enough cushion, but it don't feel good to me. Mm-mm. I rebuke a fence in the name of Jesus. Um, in Proverbs 15, 33, can we get that on the screen? It says, wisdom instructs, excuse me, wisdom's instruction is to fear the Lord and humility comes before honor. Wisdom's instruction is to fear the Lord and humility comes before honor. When it says fear the Lord, it's not talking about like, I'm in terror. Man, I can't even, I can't lift my arms up, y'all. I can't, my shirt's too tight. I mean, my, I mean my jacket. Okay, praise you, God. Probably, <laughs> but when, when, what they're talking about here, they're referencing just having a deep respect and acknowledgement for God's sovereignty. Understanding who he is, what he does for you. It has nothing to do with, with running in fear. I'm a father. There's no way I want my kid running in fear, but I do want them to respect me. I don't think there's a parent in this room that wants their kid terrified of them and don't want to be around them and running every time they see them come to the door. I'm pretty sure that's not your MO. But you do want them to respect you, respect authority, understand how that works so that they're not running over you in any way, shape, or form, but that they understand how things work. Well, in that, this is the thing. If honor takes place without humility, pride comes in. And a lot of people, I'm not saying anybody in this room, but what I am saying is there's a lot of people that have a lot of pride about who they are and what they bring to the table. I've been doing this for 15 years. Can't nobody tell me nothing. I don't need no help. It's always been this way. Young people coming in, it's going to be how I want it, and that's what's going to be. Who put you in charge? Who made you God? Because last time I checked, when systems are working, you don't disrupt systems. When you have an opportunity to enhance something, like great. But one thing we ain't never doing is, we're not, excuse me, one thing we are not ever doing is in, we, we can't enhance God. 
that's, you're, you're not, that's, so when you're talking, let's talk about people systems and biblical systems, you're not doing nothing biblically. There's nothing you can ever do to change what God's word says. Amen. Hallelujah. Mm-hmm. Tell him I'm, I, I need a coffee. Um, but in this, it says, Ephesians 4, 2 through 6, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. This is what I know, you guys. Love works. I promise you love works. I know I'm not as old as my younger, older people in the room. But in my 40 years of living, I've never heard anybody get mad at me because I chose to love them. I've never heard anybody say, hey, bro, let me tell you something. You keep loving me like that, we're going to have a problem. If anybody in here has heard that, please let me know. But I have never heard anybody get mad at me for loving them. And so what I know is love works. Why do I know it works? Because that's what Jesus did. The most powerful thing is love. And if I can love you through whatever it is that you're going through, no matter what season of life you're in, no matter what you're struggling with, no matter what sin you're struggling with, because we all are struggling with one, there's not a person in this room that can say you're not struggling with sin in any area. I don't care who you are, what you're saying. You're lying if you say you ain't struggling with no type of sin. Because our flesh is sinful by nature. Just because yours isn't worse than Tammy's don't mean that it's not sin. Sin is sin. But the reality of it is, is love works. And if we know the love works, it goes on the reads. It says, if I'm looking at the right paper... Wow. Oh, there it goes. <laughs> it says, there is one body and one spirit, just as you are called to one hope when you are called one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and one Father, or all who is over all and through all in all. For him to talk about being humble in that way, and to compare it to one God. We know how important God is. So if he's comparing it to all of the things that there's only one of, how important do you think it is for you to be humble? How important do you think it is for humility to scream very loudly from you? Because there's no way someone would choose to follow someone that is arrogant and just flamboyant about who they are and what they do and patting themselves on the back on some me, 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 me stuff. Nobody cares about what you, that's great that you did it, great, good job. But you parading around like you're the best thing since sliced bread? Nobody cares. There's 1,500 other breads out there right now. So there's nothing unique about you. You like an opinion, everybody has one. Line up, that's great. But understand that a part of this thing is modesty. And sometimes people get so caught up with modesty and they think it's just clothes. And a lot of people just want to say it to women. Watch the way you wear your dress. You know, uh, put on, don't, don't put on that so short. Don't do this. Cover yourself up. Da, 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 all those things. But what people don't know, and maybe they do, is it means discreet habits, quiet speech, and affections privately expressed. It's not just about what you wear. It's about how you live your life. And if we're living our life according to what Christ is talking about, a lot of us need to work on modesty because it ain't about how you dress. Some of it is just your attitude and how you come into church on a Sunday morning. Some of it is how you look at the person next to you like you don't even want them to breathe in your direction because you don't want to say hi. Some of it is just Somebody just, even just being annoys you. Now, there are some people, I'm sorry, sometimes, <laughs> some, sometimes the people just breathing next to me, just be like, man, for real? You act like you just, sometimes. I'm human, though, right? I, everybody has those things. In this, though, the last one we want to get to is obedience. Hallelujah, look at me, man, I'm not on time. 
Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, man. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> the, the, the last thing you're wrong is obedience. And obedience, we're looking at 1 Corinthians 12, 24, where our principal parts need no special treatment, but God has put the body together, giving greater honor in the parts that it lacked. God's arrangement of the body is divine. It needs no help. There's nothing you can do to improve it. All the cloning and stuff in the world is not going to improve God and what he has done. There's not a thing that can... This is what we have to understand. There is nothing on this earth that has life unless God breathes into it. Anything the devil can offer you, whether it's money... Cars, house, girls, boys, all that extra stuff, anything that he can offer you, guess what? It all has an expiration date. Everything will die. Your car will break down. I don't care if it's a Rolls Royce or a Pinto. <laughs> it will break down. So that's not going to last forever. Your house will eventually, it will start to rot. You will have to do some things. You will have to, you will have to maintain it. God is the only one that breathes life. So understand, no matter what the devil is offering you, it doesn't end well. It always dies. So if you're choosing to follow or accept something that he's given to you in a season because it feels good and it looks good, and oh my goodness, it tastes so good, it's going to die. And if you're not living right, and you're participating in that thing that is die, you might find yourself dying with it. And if it's that important for you to miss heaven and that opportunity to have that thing that breathes no life into you, I would wonder what your proximity looks like and what your circle is telling you and how they are investing into you what you should be as a believer of Christ. The further you go into this, obedience is recognizing and accepting the role God has assigned to each of you. Hey, I know you was a really good point guard on that team. Phenomenal. Hey, but over here, we already have a really good point guard. I know you can shoot too. Have an amazing shooter. We need you to play defense. We don't have nobody at the small four spot that can really play defense. I know you're talented enough to do these two things. But if you do those things, you're going to be an accessory. Right here, you're a necessity. Sometimes we're so caught up in what we want to do because I'm really good at this, though, and I've always done this. He's like, yeah, I know you're really good at that, but I'm trying to develop you in this because this is your calling. That's just a talent. But we get so caught up in what we want because we, we believe we know what best. Or somebody done gassed us up on premium knowing we're unleaded. I'm sorry for who it is. <laughs> but the reality is, we have to move away from what we believe we are and move to what God says we are. His word doesn't change and it doesn't fail. Honor in the Greek, to me, which is spelled like time, but it has a little accent at the end. But it means a valuing by which the price is fixed. When I read this, it kind of got me. I was like, the price is fixed. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20, Paul says, we are not our own. We were bought at a price. Having received our bodies as a gift from God, we are to use them to honor God. We were purchased with a price that nobody can afford. But yet and still, We choose to not honor, to not obey a God like that. This is one thing that I know is God is not in the business of talking to be heard. He talks to be obeyed. Wow. There, 
there's a lot of people that, how many people know somebody that just talks and just talks and talks just like trying to be heard? How many, if you're not raising your hand, it's probably you. <laughs> I'm just gonna put it out there. I see some of y'all keeping your hand down. It's you. It's okay. It's you. But myself, I'm one. Like my wife, I love my wife to death. She, she does a great job of being my barometer and helping me understand like, hey, babe, talking a little bit too much. Hey, hey, babe. Probably said a little bit too much. Hey, I'm, I, don't know, I don't know how to just, you guys know, I, I'm, I'm just me. But she helps me be a better version of me. And so with that, it's understanding <laughs> that we are all fighting against the same enemy. So why does what role you play dictate if you participate or not? Because I can't have the red shoes, I don't want to play. Because I can't sit in the front row and sing as loud as I want to with the worship team, I don't want to come to church. Because they didn't play my song for three weeks and I asked them a month ago. We can find many reasons of why not to. But the crazy part about it is, in our reasons of why not to, we don't take those same reasons to our job. We will put up with everything from our job. All the hurt, all the this, all the somebody talking about me and offending me and all this stuff like that. At work, we are going, we going back to work. We want that paycheck. But do you guys not just hear that we were bought with a price? In the paycheck that you get here, there's not a place in the world that can supersede it. But the reality of it is, is that's where we have to get to. We have to get to the point where we're understanding some things. How many of us are dependent on GPS? Y'all might as well all raise your hand. Y'all in here calling on Siri and everything else? We depend on GPS for many different things. Me, my kids, and my wife can attest. I will not turn a Siri on for nobody. I will not turn GPS on. My dad was a truck driver after playing football and doing Olympic sprinting and all that stuff. He, he loves to drive trucks. And so he, I learned how to read maps. I learned how to pitch into the road. I don't use GPS. I don't mess around with that stuff. It might lead me off a cliff. <laughs> Maybe not. But <laughs> the reality of it is, is how many of us trust God's GPS? Guy, you guys may know him, Kev on stage. He's from here in Tacoma. He, he um, a Christian comedian, and he had this one show, and it stuck with me. He was like, how many of us are following God's positioning system? How many of us are paying attention to God's positioning system as much as we're paying attention to Siri? God said, turn left. Why are you still going straight? God said, get off the exit. Why are you still going straight? What are we not paying attention to in our life that God is clearly trying to show us? Here's three things to take away. Build strong relationships. Nurture close connections in life. Value those. I tell my kids all the time, you get one mom and one dad. There can be some examples along the way and things like that and some people that kind of stand instead and that, that can be mentors and different things, but you really only get one set of parents. Honor them. Treat them well. Do well. Mr. John, I love what you do with your mother. Every single Sunday watching you is a blessing to my whole life. The man that you are, the son that you are to your mother, amazing. And that's how it should be. Two, practice honor and humility. Express gratitude to those who are often overlooked. Those people that are greeting at the door, can we show them a little bit more love than just walking by and saying, can I have a mint or whatever it is? I don't, I don't really know what, how that works over there. See, look, I need to spend a little bit more time at the door talking to, talking to you. But number three, discover your divine assignment. 
Align your actions with your purpose for meaningful impact. Discover that. You will discover everything. You will spend so much time on YouTube trying to figure out how to fix your hair, trying to figure out how to fix something on the car. Spend some time in the Word trying to figure out what God has called you to do and be in this season because it's critical, especially with everything that's going on in the world. Some of us, I'm meddling right here, but I'm going to stop meddling after this. I'm about to be done. <laughs> but some of us would rather connect to Wi-Fi than our purpose because it's easier. Your purpose is tough. It's hard. I got to go through this, and I got to do that. And then God has asked me to do this. Oh, my goodness, I'm so tired. I don't have enough time. I work too much. I do all this. But yet you find yourself sitting down being able to watch your favorite TV show at the end of the night. But you don't have time. Let's not do that. Understand this. We are dependent on our obedience. We are dependent on our honor. We are depending on our proximity. For all of this to flow, we have to make sure that we are connected. But ultimately, our salvation depends on Christ. And without him, there's no us. Without him, there's no grace. Um, I'm going to give us a moment here. So I'm going to talk to some people here and, and maybe people online. There's many that may be in this room that have never given their life to Christ, have never thought two seconds about it. But the reality of it is, is that we all need him. And uh, there's a, a former pastor of mine, he had this saying, he said, if you're 99% sure, you're 100% wrong. You can't be 99% sure that you're saved and you love Christ. You have to be 100% and know that you do. So there's some people that's in this room. And I'm telling you guys like this, this is, this is how it's going to work. I am going to have you raise your hands. I'm not going to have people close their eyes. I'm not going to have any of that because my thing is like this. If you cannot profess Christ in here and accept him in here in a loving space where he lives and breathes, how could you ever proclaim him out there? It'd be too hard. So... Don't worry about the person to your right. Don't worry about the person to your left. If you personally have never given your life to Christ and in this moment and in this day, you're like, I, I, I want to practice some of those things. I want to know a little bit about that Jesus. I want to work on my proximity. And I think my proximity probably needs to start with this guy, Jesus, that he's talking about. I'm going to have you guys just, just raise your hand. Don't worry about the person to the right, left, any of that. Just, just raise your hand up, and you can raise your hand right now. If, if that is you, I see that hand. Amen. Raise it with some authority. Because this is that we're going to celebrate you. Because this, this is not nothing that's like, oh, uh, well, I just, uh. no, it's like, yes, I need Jesus. Because if not, I don't know where I'm going to be. So it's not that. I thank God for the one, but is there anybody else? Is there anybody else that's like, I do, I might, I've been thinking about it, I'm not sure, I kind of want to. And that's okay, and for those that are online, if you are, type in online, type, I want to give my life to Christ. For the one that raised their hand, everyone, if you guys bow your head, we're going to say this prayer, we're going to all say it with the individual. All right, you can just bow your heads. Didn't we just talk about Obedience. Buy it. <laughs> Here we go. This is what we should say. Heavenly Father, repeat out to me, I'm sorry. Heavenly Father, I open my heart to you. Forgive my sins as I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. May your love guide me as I live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, let's celebrate that one. Because it says, heaven rejoices for the one. Heaven rejoices for the one. So, you all, I, I thank you guys for being here today. Just some short announcements as we, as we dismiss. One of the biggest things is, if you have been here for a while, 
and you're trying to figure out, like, how can you get connected? What are some things you can do? Where can you serve at? What's the possibilities? I, I will encourage you. There's a connect desk outside on the right before you exit out. If you want to figure out how to get connected, go to that desk. Figure out where you can serve at, whether it's tech team, whether it's worship, whether it's anything that's going on in this building, you want to know if you can connect, go and find that out. If you're here for your first time and this is your first time visiting, number one, thank you for entrusting us with your time, but also find yourself at the connect desk. Get connected. See what you can do to just understand more about the ministry so that you can be here and be blessed. Dear Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for the word. Lord, we thank you for your heart, for your people. Lord, what we do know is that your word does not go out void, and whoever needed it, Lord God, definitely would have received it. Lord, we thank you, and we hope that you bring us together again at your appointed time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.